Hello, Grade Twelves. Good to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to do a really important section on chemical change. The subsection is called rates of reaction. You might also pick it up as reaction rate. Now, this section is fundamental to so many other sections that it's really important that we lay a good foundation here and we take all the concepts that are interlinked and related, concepts of energy, concepts of uh, reactants and products, concepts of a catalyst, concepts that relate to a graph so that we can use them in later sections but I've put together a little checklist for you let's make sure that you've got this detail correct and that you understand this before you go and you're preparing for an exam you need to have a checklist do I understand this can I do that well let's have a look at our checklist here we go under reaction rates you need to make sure you can do the following you need to make sure that you can explain chemical reactions in terms of collision theory. Now that's a really important bit of theory that you need to go back to. Make sure that you can engage with it. We'll have a little bit more to say about that when we come across questions that relate to collision theory, which we'll do just now. Now the next thing that you need to be able to do uh, is you need to be able to draw energy profiles to explain energy changes in a reaction. Some of this is work that you will have covered in grade 11, but we need to recall it now for our final exam. Now, the next part is also really important, and it's really rote learning, but we need to know what the factors are that affect the rate of a chemical reaction. Guys, you are going to get a question either asking you to state the factors or to apply the factors to predict what's going to happen if something changes. So you really need to learn those. Make sure you've got them sorted out and that you've got the checklist and you say, yes, I know all the factors and I can explain these factors in terms of collision theory as well. That's really important. The next two are really critical as well, and you'll see that in common exam papers. You're required to interpret interpret different graphs that demonstrate the rate of a reaction and often what has come up recently in exam papers you're asked to describe the scientific investigation and you need to be able to understand the process that's taking place in the context of reaction rates so with that little checklist Hope that's reminded you of some key points. Let's go and have a look at some questions that have been selected from previous exam papers so that you can prepare yourself. As we're going through these, make a mental note. Yes, I know that. Yes, I know that. I've got the checklist all sorted out. But if you practice in this way, you'll be sure to make sure that when you're faced with a new question in the exam, you can access the uh, information that you've organized and stored in your memory to be able to get 100% on this section. It's really not impossible to do that. So let's go and have a look at the first question. And uh, we're looking at question one here. It's taken from the November 2011 paper, and it's question nine on that paper, but it's our question number one. So what does it say? It says, uh, study the following reactions. We're given two reactions. When you are given your exam paper, make some notes about it. So you've got uh, reaction A, which gives you X plus Y, goes to, uh, goes to give you R plus uh, S, and you're told that the delta H, the heat of reaction, or the enthalpy, is minus, please make note of that, minus 200 kilojoules per mole. It also tells you the activation energy for the reaction is 350 kilojoules per mole. Now what about reaction B, slightly different, tells you it's C plus D, gives you E plus F, and at this stage notice that the delta H, the heat of reaction, enthalpy, is a positive value. Now, in your head, you should be, as you're reading that, you should automatically be thinking, uh, I'm not even looking at the question, what can I interpret? I notice that there's a difference here. There's a negative delta H and there's a positive delta H. As soon as you see delta H, you must be asking yourself, what's this telling me? If it's negative, it's less than zero, which means that it is exothermic. So I'm going to write in over here, exothermic. 
And if it's positive, then it's going to be endothermic. So even though they might not have asked a question about it, I've written down this information so that when I do see the questions, I can relate to them and I'm not having to think minus, less than zero, positive. I've already made the link. I don't have to do that over and over again. So also notice here that the activation energy for the second reaction is 600 kilojoules per mole. And so this one requires more activation energy. The activation energy here is bigger. And you should just take a note of that as you're reading through. So you're starting to interpret. Now let's get into the question. The first question that we're asked over here is, are the above reactions endothermic uh, or exothermic? Okay, so we want to n recognize and we have to explain. So let's set it out very neatly and very nicely. What we're going to say is for reaction A, reaction A, we recognize that delta H is going to be less than zero. So that means it must be exothermic. Now, to check that it is exothermic, we need to make sure that we understand what delta H is. A very good way of doing that is just sketching an energy profile to check that we've got it all clear as well. You don't have to do this in the exam, but I think it's a good just reminder for us while we're going through this question. So if I were to draw an energy profile diagram, I'm going to draw my axis over there, and this is going to be energy. And this is going to be the reaction coordinate. And what we have over here is the energy of the reactants. And over here, for this reaction, because it's exothermic, we're going to put the products over there. And we complete the profile by drawing in the loop over here. Now, I hope you can see that as a result of this, your delta H is represented by that difference there. The difference between the uh, energy of the products. So what is delta H? Delta H is the energy of the product minus the energy of the reactant. The reactants are the things that we start with, the product are the things that we end with. So have a look at this and we take the values and, and, and see it clearly. When the products have a lower energy, these are lower, this is lower, and the reactant here is higher. So if we take the energy of the product minus the energy of the reactant, uh, we're going to get a negative delta H. And I hope you can see as well, in this particular graph, in this profile, what makes it very clearly exothermic is the activation energy, the energy required to put in, is less than the energy that is released. This is the energy released. So that's why delta H is negative for an exothermic reaction. Hope you've got all that information and you can check it for yourself so you've got it very clearly. Now let's move on to the part B because although we've done all of that, we didn't really need to do it for our answer. Right, let's write out for reaction B, what have we got? Have a look again at the information that is given. Remember that here the activation energy was given as 600 which is a big amount, bigger than the previously, uh, but the important information, not the activation energy, but the delta H. And we recognize that it's positive, 150 kilojoules per mole. So what we're going to say, for reaction B, we've got the following. We've got delta H is positive. It's greater than zero. This means that it is an endothermic reaction. 
very quickly, remind yourself what would the energy profile look like. We have energy on this side and we have reaction coordinate. And what we're going to recognize here is that the reactants have a lower energy than the products. So the energy graph profile is going to look like that. Now notice here the delta H value is going to be between there and there. It's always between those two. And remember what we've said, that delta H is going to be the energy of the product minus the energy of the reactant. And if you read off the value over here, you can see that the product here is going to have a, a higher value. So that's a higher value. And if we take subtract from a higher value, the lower value for the reactant, you're going to get a positive. And this is an endothermic reaction. Why? Because you need more activation energy and less energy is released. That energy released is small compared to the activation energy. So the reaction takes in energy, it doesn't give it out. With an exothermic reaction, exo, exit, gives out. So you need to make those links and make sure that you've got it all sorted out. Let's move on to the next question, the next part of this question. And they've asked the question about what is meant by the term activation energy? Really important that you don't get confused between activation energy, the Ea, and the delta H. Activation energy is the energy required to start a reaction. Now, you might be saying, but how does that work? Well, let's think of a practical example. Uh, we know that, for example, something like paper uh, at burns very easily. But we know that at room temperature, paper can sit on the desk and it can sit around the house and it's not suddenly going to start burning. But if, if we had to put paper into a very high energy environment where the temperature was high, it would immediately start burning. So what we recognize is this activation energy is an energy barrier. It prevents reactions happening. And as we increase the temperature, we can get a reaction going. So the energy comes from the environment. We have to put something in. So you can have a piece of magnesium ribbon lying out in oxygen. It's going to tarnish a little bit. But if you put it into a Bunsen flame and just give it a spark of energy, that's the activation energy. It will burst into this brilliant white flame. That's what we're saying, activation energy. It's the energy that is required to get the molecules of the reactants combining in a way so that there are successful products formed. In that process, they are either absorbing energy or releasing energy. And we have to tell what the difference is. They will absorb some energy and they will release some energy. Which is more, which is less, tells you whether it's an exo or endothermic reaction. Okay, let's move on. Next part, it says, this is a very good question and it's very critical that we understand it. It says, from the information that we've been given, uh, deduce. So we've got to make some prediction. We've got to gather that information, process it, analyze it, make some statement about it, about the rate of the reaction. And we've got to explain, and it's the reactions. So for reaction A, what can we say about the reaction rate? Now, there are many factors that influence reaction rate. Uh, we know what some of those factors are. Is there a catalyst present? What are the concentrations of the uh, substances? None of that information is given. What is the temperature given? So what we're going to have to assume is that everything is of the same nature. If we're comparing 
uh, reactant A, uh, reaction A, and reaction B. Let's make some assumptions that the particle size, the concentration, and the temperature of the environment is all the same. Once we've made those, then it's a fair test to start to compare uh, which one may have a bigger or slower reaction. Now, we don't know about concentration. We're not going to interpret anything about it. The critical information that we're going to use here is around energy because they've given us energy. And if they give us energy, we need to think about temperature. So what are we told? We're told that the activation energy over here for part A is 350 kilojoules per mole. 350 kilojoules per mole. And what does that mean? It means that this is a small amount of energy compared to reaction B. For reaction B, the activation energy, if you take a look, is 600 kilojoules per mole. So I've extracted the important information. Now, if we've got a small activation energy at a particular temperature, and you've got a large activation energy, almost double the activation energy, at the same temperature, the reactants are all at the same, otherwise it wouldn't be a fair test, then what can you say? Well, we remember that that uh, temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules of the reactants and the uh, uh, that are, are in the system the whole system so what we need to recognize is that at for a low activation energy there will be more reactant molecules that will have the specific activation energy so it's likely that we're going to get more molecules here more molecules will have uh, the activation energy or greater than or more than in here we'll have less molecules with the activation energy or more as long as a molecule has the activation energy, it can combine with another molecule and form a product. So what we're recognizing here, because the activation energy is less, the chances of a reaction, a collision proceeding successfully is greater. So what I'm going to conclude over here, if the temperature is all the same, then we can expect more successful collisions. And if we get more successful collisions, then that means a higher, a higher rate of reaction. Compared to here, where you're going to get less co successful collisions. And that means that you're going to have a lower rate of reaction. Guys, really the important thing here is on this question, we need to understand that it's because the temperature is the same. If they were at different temperatures, we couldn't say much about the reaction rate. But we're going to assume that at the same temperature, that reaction A would probably have a higher rate of reaction than reaction B because it has a lower activation energy. I hope I've explained that and that you've followed the reasoning behind it. Okay, so last part of this question says to us, what can be done to reduce the amount of activation energy needed in a reaction? Now, guys, this is pure theory. You really need to know this. doesn't matter whether it's endothermic or exothermic. The easiest way to remind ourselves is, again, to look at an energy profile. And I'm just going to draw one uh, typical profile, make it something that is slightly endothermic. Let's just make it definitely endothermic. Um, in an energy profile like that, uh, you'd recognize you've got a, re 
uh, activation energy, the energy that's required to be put in over there, quite a lot a high activation energy. Now we want to know how we can reduce it. Uh, we want to add something to this system. And if we add a catalyst, then the profile will change like that. The activation energy is now less. And that's exactly what we want to be able to show. The activation energy for a catalyst is now less. Uh, that's the activation with a catalyst. And that's the answer. How are we going to make sure that we reduce the amount of activation? The only way is to provide a catalyst. Catalyst usually works on the purpose of a surface. You put something there, the catalyst gets involved. It's not used up. It remains as a substance. You start with a certain amount of it at the beginning. At the end of the reaction, the same amount will still be there. So really important that you understand both the mechanism and what a catalyst does. Catalyst speeds up the reaction by reducing the amount of activation energy required. Okay, well, I think it's time for a short break. We've covered energy and energy profiles and made sure that we've got a clear understanding of exo and endothermic. We're going to a break now. After the break, we'll look at another question where we'll look at some investigation type questions. See you after the break. Welcome back grade 12s, we're busy doing rates of reaction and we're moving on to what has become a really popular type of question where the examiners ask about the investigative process using a typical reaction where some variables are changed, they do some sort of investigation uh, in the context of a rate of reaction. So let's have a look at this. Uh, question 2. It comes from the November 2011 paper 2 and it says learners use copper 2 oxide powder. Put it in capitals, needs to be ringing bells in your head. To decompose hydrogen peroxide, they add 1 gram of copper 2 oxide to 100 centimeters cubed of hydrogen peroxide in a flask connected to a delivery tube. So you're starting to get a picture of what should be happening. The reaction that takes place is represented by the following balanced equation. Now we've got hydrogen peroxide which is a starting thing even if you didn't know that that's the formula for hydrogen peroxide it said decompose. Decompose means break down. So we should re recognize that that's the reactant and these are the products. Now what are we asked? Write down the name of one item of apparatus that can be used to measure the volume of the gas produced. Look at the equation. You recognize there's the gas produced. So if we've got a setup of a flask with a delivery tube on it, what are we going to collect the gas in? Well, there are a number of options. We could use a gas syringe. So we could do something like this. There's our flask and we've got our delivery tube off it, it's stoppered, and we could put in a syringe, a gas syringe. That would be one of the ways of measuring. The other alternative way of measuring would be to use the same sort of flask, but to use a inverted, uh, do the delivery tube perhaps into water and into a beaker uh, or a, a container, and you invert a measuring cylinder or a burette or something like that. So let me just change the color of my pen. And we're going to put in a measuring cylinder or a burette like that. And uh, this part here is all going to be full of water. The gas bubbles bubble up. They push the water down. And the answer here in that setup, we would be using a measuring cylinder to measure the amount of the amount of water, uh, oxygen collected here. The easier way to do it would be a gas syringe. Please make sure that you write them out and that you've got it uh, correctly set up. So you've got a picture now of what's happening. Let's move on to our next question. It tells us that the volume of oxygen gas produced is measured every 10 seconds. The results are shown in the graph. So there we've got our graph, the volume of oxygen, 
and its time. And we notice the intervals are 10 seconds, 10, 20, 30, and so on. And the intervals here are going up in 10 units of 10, 10, 20, and so on. And we see that the small divisions are five in between. So uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. Always important when you get a graph that you work out what the scale is, what the small units are, because if they ask you to read something off, you need to work it out. So even if you had to jot down small block is two centimeters cubed, that's not a bad idea. And over here, we recognize that the, the, the blocks um, are evenly spaced and the big one a uh, big block is five five seconds for a big block interpreting off a graph is as I said really important now it tells us use the graph to determine the volume of oxygen gas collected at 15 seconds now when you see 15 seconds you must go to the correct axis you must go to the correct axis at least. So we're looking for time of 15 seconds. Now notice what we said. One big block is 5 seconds. So 15 lies between 10 and 20. So we recognize that we must be somewhere exactly over there. That's going to be 15 seconds. Now what we need to do is to read off how much gas was collected. So I'm going to select a, a user ruler and I'm going to select that line going up there just make sure that it's exactly on the line and I've put it on the line over there like that and now I use my ruler again and I start at that point and I read off so I want to know what's that point now do you see how helpful it is that I know that small block is two centimeters I can now easily read off I can say well I know that I was a 20 22 24 so very easily very straightforward make sure that I can read it off but I don't just want to write 24 I must write 24 centimeters cubed and of oxygen that's what they asked of, of oxygen gas were collected at 15 seconds so we've got it make sure you've got those graph skills sorted out next one it says how does the rate, and here it becomes the interesting question, again referring to this graph, how does the rate of reaction change between 40 seconds and 70 seconds? So let's go and, uh, go and notice where we are. But the other important information is that it says write down only increase, decrease, or remain the same, and refer to the graph to explain the answer. So w the examiner is giving us very specific instructions here. He doesn't want an essay, and somewhere in the essay we can say something. No, the first thing we must decide, is it an increase, is it a decrease, or is it remaining the same? Let's go and have a look at the graph. We want between 40 seconds and 70 seconds. Now, 40 seconds is over here and 70 seconds using is over there so when we're looking at a graph like this the way that I like to do it is to say to myself the rate of reaction is related to the gradient of the graph at the different points so I'm going to draw in a gradient over there and I'm going to draw another one over here and I'm going to draw another one in over there and another one over there now hopefully you'll be able to see that the gradient is changing uh, if we take it further back you'd see it was steeper but we don't want to to recognize there what's that one it was quite steep not too steep what's happening to it it's flattening out and over here it's, it's getting very close to zero over here it's almost horizontal so what's happening to the gradient the gradient is decreasing and remember that the gradient is the same as the rate. It's related to rate. The gradient of the volume time graph is related to the rate of reaction. That's why we measure how much product have we produced in a certain amount of time. So what have we got here? We've got a decrease. Let's put it in. We're going to say decreases. Don't say anything else we want that word now when you are to explain it 
then recognize that you can start to put it in a sentence. But leave that on the next line. Say, from the graph, we notice that the gradient decreases from a positive value, from a positive value at 40 seconds to zero at 70 seconds. We noticed it was zero because it, remember zero gradient is it's flat and that's what we saw. Remember when the gr gr gradient is flat, when the line is parallel like that, it means the reaction is over and that's what we can expect. The reaction's not going to carry on forever. But we've answered the question. Hope you've got that. Next part, what is the function of copper 2 oxide in this reaction? Now, look at the, re the equation that they give you. We recognize that was a reactant. These are the products. But the copper 2 oxide is written above the arrow. The copper 2 oxide is a catalyst. It's not a product. It's not a reaction. It's a catalyst. And so what is the function? We identify that it is a catalyst. What is the function of the catalyst? So we say copper 2 oxide, I'm just writing it as the formula, is a catalyst for this reaction. And what does a catalyst do? It lowers the activation energy and speeds and so speeds up or increases the reaction rate got it next very interesting question 2.5 let's have a read through it Apart from oxygen, write down the names or formula of two substances present in the flask after 90 seconds. So when you look at 90 seconds, what can, can we say? The reaction is over. The reaction is complete. Now, in this case, what we need to re recognize is what would be left in the flask other than oxygen. Well, oxygen we can't consider. What other product have we got? Well, we've got water, H2O, so we can write down water. It's one of the products. It said or, so I'm giving you both. It's either H2O or water. But what else will remain in the flask? Well, guys, we don't know if any of the reactants are still there. We would be taking a chance. We don't know. There could be some reactant because it might not, be, uh, might not have completely. But knowing this reaction, you only had one and it is decomposing. And with a catalyst, it's likely to be complete decomposition. So there's no other thing. You can't say that the one substance, one reactant was in excess and the other wasn't. So in that sense, it would be a very risky thing to say there might be some uh, hydrogen peroxide. I don't think there will be any hydrogen peroxide. So if we ignore that, what else? If we take away, we say, no, there's no hydrogen peroxide. It's all decomposed. What else are we left with? Well, we can't use oxygen. Well, what else is in the equation? Ah, there we go. It's the copper 2 oxide. So we're going to write it as copper to oxide and we're going to write the formula correctly as CuO. Now remember that's the important thing. A catalyst will be at the start and it will be the end and it won't change in its mass or composition. You won't lose any. It will be there. That's what makes it a catalyst. A very special type of uh, substance. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the last question of this uh, particular part. I think it's the last one. So it says, the learners found that oxygen is produced at a slower rate. 
Now, here we come to a typical question. When one gram of a solid lump of copper 2 oxide is used, fully explain this observation. Now, guys, this is unusual because usually we don't think about the effect of size or concentration on a catalyst. Here, they're asking us to say, what is the surface going to do if we have a lump compared to powder? Remember in the original question, we said powder. Now, here's the important thing. Powder in any substance produces smaller particles, smaller particles, that's easy to see, particles. And if you've got smaller particles, you've got a larger surface area. Whereas if you use a lump, the same mass, the particles on are it's one thing. So the surface area, surface area is smaller. And if you've got a smaller surface area with a catalyst, you want the reactants to stick to that surface area. Now, if there's not enough space, they're not going to be able to stick in. So it's important for us to recognize with a smaller surface area, less space for the reaction to take place, and therefore it will be slower. So it makes sense. With powder, you've got a larger surface area. With, the, with a lump, you'll have a smaller surface area, and therefore the reaction rate reaction rate is slower, is lower or slower because fewer molecules can stick to the surface of the catalyst. They need to stick to the surface of the catalyst in order to decompose. That's the whole purpose of it. So in the reaction, the catalyst is providing a point for those uh, substances to stick there. If you decrease the, the surface area, they're not going to stick. Okay, moving on. It says, it's known that bad breath is due to uh, a bacterial activity in the mouth in the in the absence of oxygen. Use the reaction above to explain why a solution containing hydrogen peroxide can be used uh, to improve bad breath. Okay, so let's have a look at that. We need the absence of oxygen. The absence of oxygen. Now, what you need to recognize is that hydrogen peroxide if we have it in the presence of bacteria, it's not going to have oxygen. So there's no oxygen present. It's going to actually uh, prevent um, the substances, the bacteria decomposing. And so it will produce oxygen, yes, but with no oxygen present at the start, um, it works effectively as a mouthwash. And the second reason that it's important that we can use it as a mouthwash is when it decomposes, look what it's producing. It's producing substances that are quite harmless. Water, we like water, we can't live without it, and we like oxygen. It's not going to be poisonous and it works really well. So there are two aspects to this. The reason uh, is that we've got the absence of oxygen. So if we use H2O, there's no oxygen no oxygen at the start. It works without oxygen. It will decompose without oxygen. And that's what's going to make it work. The products formed with hydrogen peroxide decomposing will be harmful to the bacteria, but won't be harmful to us uh, because the bacteria um, is, doesn't like oxygen. Uh, if there was oxygen, they're going to, to be die, they're going to uh, die off. They're going to reduce in their population. Notice that it's due to the, the activity in the absence of oxygen. So if we provide oxygen, the bacteria are going to not survive. So I hope that makes sense to you. The oxygen is going to be helpful for us, or not harmful to us, and the water is going to be not harmful to us, but the oxygen is not going to like the, um, the bacteria. Bacteria aren't going to like the oxygen, and so it will cure the bad breath story. 
Right, I think it's time for a break. So we're going to take a short one. Right after this, we're going to be looking at another very interesting graph that you might come across. See you after the break. Welcome back, guys. We're ready to get into question number three. Now, don't be put off by this question. It deals with a very interesting graph called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. But you do need to understand this particular type of graph and be able to interpret it. That's why we've chosen this question. So have a look at it. Question three. A catalyst speeds up the rate of reaction. We've sp spent some time talking about a, a catalyst. The behavior of a catalyst can be explained in terms of activation energy and collision theory. And here we've got the Boltzmann, uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, curve. It tells us that the label on the vertical axis is the number of particles. The horizontal axis is energy. This line here is the activation energy. And th so this little annotation tells us it's the number of, of particles with enough energy to react. So this is a curve. It's a statistical representation. Uh, it's telling you what percentage, it's like a bell curve that you might have come across in mathematics. So recognize it's telling you how the energy of the group is related. So let's have a look at it. We recognize that there is a high number of particles um, that have, that's the number of particles that have that energy. All of these particles uh, under that curve represent particles that have this amount of energy from zero to that position there. So. I hope you can see it. Within a percentage, that looks to me um, just less than 50%. These ones are getting, uh, there are less particles with higher energy. So up to this point, we had increasing number of particles. Here, these ones were low energy. These ones got a high energy. Now, you've got fewer particles with higher energy than that. So this is on the other side, le uh, on the other side of the, the curve. And what we recognize, there are very few particles here that have enough energy to overcome that energy barrier that we've seen in the energy profile diagrams that we drew earlier. So make sure that you've got this sorted out. Now let's see what the question says. It says, explain in terms of collision theory and activation energy how a catalyst influences the rate of reaction. So what do we know? First of all, a catalyst... What do we know about it? It provides an alternative path or pathway uh, for reaction, for a reaction. And by doing that, it lowers the activation energy, lowers the activation energy. We drew that on the energy profile earlier. So it lowers the activation energy. And this alternative pathway is usually to provide a surface where more effective collisions take place. So let me just draw very quickly. In terms of collision theory, if we've got uh, different particles, and I'm going to just draw three of them in that color, and I'm going to draw another three in another color, or, another color and say that they were in a uh, in a container they were in this space over here now uh, randomly moving around they're going to bump into each other and if they bump into each other we recognize that this one might bump into that one and it might form a new molecule uh, the chances of that happening are not very good because Initially, they're, quite, they're spaced quite far apart, and if they're moving randomly, they might not have successful collisions. But if we have a catalyst, and I want to represent that in a different way now. Here's my catalyst, and let's say that the catalyst is able to hold on to these molecules like that. Now, the molecules are tightly held on a surface. It gives the green ones more chance if they're going to be moving over here and it gives them the possibility that they will collide because they're closer together uh, with those ones. So in this way, a catalyst 
by providing a surface for reaction provides more successful collisions. So uh, that's the mechanics of it. So what we would say in terms of collision theory, of collision theory, we needed to do both, collision theory, a catalyst ensures that more molecules will have successful collisions for two reasons, successful collisions and the two reasons are one there's a lower activation energy and the second thing is that a surface usually we have a surface uh, is provided by the catalyst which concentrates crowds up concentrates the reactants and we know if we've got them closer together uh, the reactant molecules it makes it a better chance for collisions to take place right hope you got that let's move on next part of the question it tells us that we are to do the following it says redraw the above distribution curve and show a new activation when a catalyst is added uh, to the reaction mixture on the diagram well I'm not going to redraw it I'm going to just use this sketch in your exam you'd probably be given this in an answer book but you would need to fill in uh, on the answer book where the new line is going to be. So this is without a catalyst, the activation line without a catalyst. Now if we recognize that with a catalyst, a catalyst is going to have a lower activation energy. So that was the activation energy without a catalyst. With a catalyst, let's put in a line to show with a catalyst. Put that one in and we're going to say this is the activation energy put it in yellow so we're going to say that's the activation energy with a catalyst and immediately I hope you can see that there are a whole lot more molecules that can actually overcome the energy barrier and so what we've got is an increased number of uh, molecules with enough energy to cross and so therefore we can recognize that it will increase the rate of reaction and I think that's what they ask us to uh, apply our knowledge to over here it now says to us the following use the same information and it's all put together for that reason when milk is left at room temperature it spoils rapidly However, in a refrigerator, it stays fresh for a longer time. Use collision theory to explain this observation. Now, again, we can look at the graph and we can start to do some summation from the graph. What they're actually saying here is compare two environments. Compare a fridge and compare the room. And what do we know the difference between them? here you've got a lower temperature and here you've got a higher temperature now what do we know about temperature remember temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the molecules and so if we're looking at average kinetic energy here this is going to be a higher average kinetic energy and here we're going to have a low average kinetic energy so what are we saying that the molecules at a, and the fridge are going to be most of them are going to have a lower uh, uh, average kinetic energy which means that it is likely that the lower average kinetic energy is going to be less than the activation energy where here the, it's going to be more molecules will be have EA or more. 
So just have a look at it on the graph here, and you would see if that's the activation energy, and we were to, to think about it in terms of at a low temperature, very small number of molecules will have the activation energy. So in a fridge, not much decomposition. If we had to redraw this graph for a different temperature, which you would, could be asked to do, then you would recognize at a different temperature, more molecules have the energy. Let's just quickly sketch that so that you can see it. So at an increased temperature, now it's interesting that what happens at an increased temperature is the bubble moves over a little bit. That's not a very good diagram. So let me just redraw it, uh, try and get that graph in for us. There we go. And what you're going to see here is that more molecules, more molecules are going to be reacting. When this temperature here, that is the temperature is higher. Okay. Well, guys, I hope that makes a whole lot of sense. Been great being with you. Please remember to practice and remember that reaction rates are linked to other sections, particularly chemical equilibrium. And so I wish you all the best. Bye for now.